species. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> anyway, Neil is a botanist and uh, he's done some great work here on the peninsula, identifying a lot of species and uh, done work with bryophytes and soil crust. But Neil also is great at uh, identifying plants. And um, we were talking at our uh, board meeting. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we were talking about our board meeting uh, about things that we need. And a lot of people uh, are not really clear on how to identify plants. So that's something that we would like, you know, kind of the basics on. So uh, Neil's very good at it and good at explaining things. So. Uh, I'm turning it over to Neil Yulman. Um, you could you, we'll just give a brief recap of your background for the recording, and then let's get into it. Okay, great. I think I'm off mute here. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Great. Yes. So, um, uh, like David said, um, uh, my name is Neil Yulman. Um, I'm a botanist, a, particularly a field botanist here in Southern California. Um, I have a master's in environmental science with an emphasis in botany. Um, there, through my master's, I studied bryophytes on the Palos Verdes Peninsula and biological soil crust. And I've worked um, for the local land conservancy, the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy, and I've done a few other consulting jobs in the field. Um, so yeah, I've, you know, mostly um, my work has taken me in the field with plant identification um, and also through my graduate work as well. Um, and um, so yeah, that's a little bit about myself. And then Dave, like David was saying that, you know, they asked me to give a little talk on identification and identification is, it's a big thing, but it's definitely doable. You know, plant identification, um, you know, when I first started seemed daunting, but uh, as you get more into it, it actually gets less and less daunting and it actually gets more and more fun. And then all of a sudden you find yourself seriously hooked on it. Um, and so this, this presentation um, that I put together kind of, it encompasses basic plant identification. We'll go over kind of the basics of um, kind of like vascular plants, the flower, uh, leaves, um, some of the kind of the key things to have in your toolbox and understanding to um, kind of help you with, you know, progressing your identifications with plants and stuff like that. Um, and since I did a little bit with bryophytes, um, I'm going to kind of weave them in. Uh, sometimes they get a little uh, daunting to, for folks just because they are small, super small, but uh, they are doable. And it's just the same, you know, tools and uh, ways of identification are used for bryophytes as well. So I'll try to weave that in as well and, and, and um, also talk about some of the common uh, plant families that are around here, both um, with bryophytes and vascular plants. Um, so here we go. Uh, so a little with my introduction. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, I have my master's in environmental science. Uh, this picture down here um, is of my son who uh, is standing next to a new population of Erigeron palus verdensis, um, which is actually a new species that I just recently described. Um, Intentively, it's an endemic to the peninsula. So that's always cool. And that came out of a lot of field work and a lot of uh, work with identification with Erigeron too, which is uh, always helpful. Um, but yeah, exciting stuff. So um, again, it's, it's something that you can do and really get good at and then start to see differences in species out there. There's still a lot of stuff we don't know about even just basic um, common species. Um, and you know, when you get really good identification, you start to pick out all these differences and stuff like that. Um, so it can be helpful. So moving on, um, California, that's where we live and it's incredible. You guys, everybody is lucky that lives in California because they live in such a diverse state. Uh, you know, topography is diverse. You know, we have deserts, we have mountains, we have the ocean. It's incredible. Um, and with all this diversity in California, it comes with it a diversity of plants. Um, and California is just a hot spot for plant diversity. Um, so you get out hiking and you're you're you know exploring the you know high Sierras or you're down in the desert. Um, and if you're interested in plants, you want to start to learn about these plants. You really get excited about what are these things all around me? You know, these, these big trees, what kind of tree is that? You see these little tiny things growing next to a stream. What are those plants? Um, and you start to have those questions. And the, the, the way to answer those questions is through identification. Um, and so that's where plant identification comes into effect. Let me just adjust my screen here. Okay, um, so you come across, you're hiking in, in California, um, and you come across a really cool plant, um, and you, you pick it up, and you're like, okay, so what is this? How would I even 
begin to determine what it is. Um, and that's the process of plant identification. It's the matching of an unknown plant specimen to the correct taxon, trying to figure out what that plant is. Um, so again, you know, you have, um, let me see if I can pull up spotlight here. I don't know if anybody can, can you guys see that? Um, so you have a, a, you just say, for example, you have this plant right here, not too sure it is. So what you're going to do is um, you're going to use a couple methods of plant identif identification. Um, if you're more advanced and you have that uh, knowledge base, you're going to start with probably a dichotomous key. And that's just a systems of steps that you go through to figure out what that plant is. And there's keys as it's the Jepson manual um, that you can use and uh, determine what that is. Or if you're just starting, um, you can actually go through field guides too. Sometimes, you know, I even get stumped and I'll just bust out one of those picture field guides and go through it and start to just try to match something. And that's sometimes the best way to do it too when you're starting out is actually just trying to figure out um, based on the picture, just matching that picture. Like, okay, that flower is purple. It kind of looks like this. It kind of looks like that. And you go through the field guide or you can actually go to a herbarium if you're really, really into it and you can uh, look through the her, uh, uh, herbarium samples and actually start to learn what those plants are too. That's a little bit trickier um, and you, use, you usually use keys with that as well, but there's numerous ways you can go through plant identification and then hopefully by the end of it, uh, you haven't given up and you come out with what your species is, and that's the Western Vervain for this picture over here. So that's the process. And what we're going to be talking about again is that middle stuff, what you need to be able to get to that end um, taxon or that species. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Uh, so tools. So kind of just uh, looking at some of the tools you'll need uh, in order to do plant identification. Um, Loops. So loops are really important. They give you a way of um, using uh, ma uh, magnification in the field. Um, and a loop about 10x to 20x should be perfect, even for bryophytes as well. Um, but something that you can take in the field, um, and these are really great, really cheap. Um, you can pick them up pretty much anywhere. Amazon's a really great place you can pick them up um, and having one with you is going to help. Um, and then when you get back with, uh, you know, your specimen or your um, plant that you're unsure of, you might need a microscope. So um, usually a dissecting microscope is plenty enough, um, especially if you're working with vascular plants um, for IDing. And that's, you know, just a normal one. They don't run that much. They're pretty, pretty cheap. Um, or you could, you can actually just, you know, find somebody that has one or hook up with a university and maybe even use, use theirs. But, you know, when you really get into identification, you are going to need some, some magnification and a dissecting uh, microscope does it. Um, a ruler, uh, you know, a metric ruler would be great to have with you too. Oftentimes you have to do a lot of measurements um, to determine, uh, you know, certain things like what's the length of the Corolla versus the Calyx. And we'll talk about that. Um, so a ruler is really helpful. Um, a camera. So a camera is really great nowadays too, because um, it's harder and harder to, um, you know, you know, back in the day, you could you could collect a specimen pretty easily, you know, take it from the field and bring it back to ID. It gets a little bit trickier nowadays, um, but photographs help a lot. So you can oftentimes take a photograph, um, and especially if you're working um, out in the field with a key, you can actually photograph certain points of uh, on the flower or on the plant that you need, and you can bring it back and take a look at that as well. Um, some fine tweezers are really helpful for when you get to into the, the tedious dissection, um, pulling uh, flower parts, of, you know, Getting into the flower and pulling it apart um, helps, and some really fine uh, tip scissors help as well. And then my my uh, really good advice on uh, some tools is a, a really great uh, razor blade. Uh, razor blades help with making some cross sections, but I'll show you which come in uh, come come in handy. And uh, I have to pass on this this brand uh, after I took a lichen workshop, and they have to take some really thin cross sections through lichens. Um, and the presenter uh, recommended these Wilkinson's swords. Uh, and you can pick them up on Amazon and they are the best razor blades. So I have to pass that on. They work so well for, um, you know, doing cross sections and stuff like that. So definitely pick up uh, some razor blades as well. Okay, so taxonomy. Um, Taxonomy, again, so we're going to kind of talk about uh, taxonomy and classification, just to give you a background on what that is, because um, that's kind of what 
plant identification is anchored in. And so taxonomy is just a system created by scientists to keep track of and classify all living things. So it's a way of grouping things that are similar, keeping track of all that, so we can kind of, kind of keep track of all living things and what's out there. So the hierarchy of plant taxonomy. So you probably recognize this. Um, you know, you've probably come across it in some science class that you've had in the past. Um, it's just a breakdown of all the groups out there: domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Um, and that can that's a lot. That's a lot of information just packed in those few things. Um, but our focus really. Um, is, you know, around phylum, so we're, we're, or kingdom, we're, you know, talking about plant, the plant kingdom, but you can actually, for plant identification, especially for beginners, you can kind of skip this part here and come focus down on this bottom part right here where there's family, genus, and species. Um, that's where it really helps. That's where you really got to have to have the information um, in place. Uh, you can get, once you get family, genus, and species down, you can jump up to the order, um, and that helps even more, um, and that can be helpful again in the field, but family genus and species is definitely getting used uh, used to that the family so how plants the certain uh, groups of plants how they're related to each other and form that family um, is really helpful so when you go out there you can actually start to pick out families and then you can kind of just get right to the point with that family and start to ID out of that family. So getting familiar with families, we won't talk much about the characteristics that make up certain plant families. Um, Cause that's, again, it's a little bit more beyond. We're going to just talk about um, kind of the basics of some of the plant families, just so you can kind of, kind of understand them and recognize them in the field. But um, as you work more and more with plant identification, you're going to want to focus on your families there too. Um, and then plant names. So when you get down to the species, being familiar that plants have a scientific name. Um, and if you're familiar with biology and stuff like that, and uh, the scientific name is it's a two part name. Uh, you have your genus and then your species. And then uh, so like, for example, this black sage right here, um, its common name is black sage, but its scientific name is salvia mellifera. Um, so like if I'm talking to somebody in another part of the world, um, if I mention black sage, it might be like black sage. Are you talking about my black sage, that black sage? Not too sure what kind of black sage. But if I say, well, black sage, but salvia mellifera, um, that that scientific name is universal. So they should know what I'm talking about when I say salvia mellifera. Um, so, yeah, again, universal. It's good to get familiar with those those scientific names as well with plant identification. Okay, so plant classification, groupings of plants, essentially, and I just wanted to put this slide in here uh, to show you that there are there are a lot of diversity, or there's a lot of diversity in uh, the plant kingdom and groups of plants, um, and we're focusing more on the embryophytes, which are our land plants, um, and within the land plants, you have the bryophytes, which uh, we'll talk about a little bit over here, and these guys are um, unique in that they they're non-vascular, so they don't have um, you know that plumbing that our vascular friends have. Um, they produce spores, so they don't they don't make flowers and they don't make seeds, but they reproduce um, by the spore. So they have spores, um, and they they are represented by three lineages that are your mosses here, um, your liverworts. Uh, sorry, your hornworts and then your liverworts over here. And again, we've got a picture of the spore down there. And they often have, um, sometimes they look like they have roots, but they don't have, they're called rhizoids, which just anchor uh, the plant to the ground, uh, but they don't function like roots. Uh, and then jumping over to your vascular plants over here, you get into um, a whole other bunch of plants that are, are common on the landscape. And one of them that I did try to touch a little bit in this is on uh, ferns and those are, are your vascular plants but they're spore producing plants uh, so they they actually produce spore but they are vascular they have vascular tissue just like um, your your other vascular plants and your angiosperm your flowering plants um, and they're represented by the pteridophytes your ferns um, and I'm, I'm leaving off some other uh, members of that as well um, but uh, Again, just wanted to focus on, on ferns for basic plant identification. Then jumping over to your vascular plants um, that produce uh, seeds, um, but they're vascular and they produce seeds are your gymnosperms. And I'm just going to just mention them. I'm not going to talk much about them today. Um, and then you 
jumping down below your gymnosperms, you have your vascular plants uh, that produce seeds, but they also produce flowers. And that's what makes them unique as angiosperms, that they're flowering plants. Um, and again, down here, you have your flower structure down here. So we're going to, again, focus on your vascular plants. Sorry, one sec. And sorry, I apologize if I'm moving a little fast. It's just not to cover. Okay, um, so here we go. We're gonna just dive into plant identification. So you're out in the field and you come across uh, some plants. Uh, the first thing you kind of want to note is, is it, what growth habit is it? What's going on? What is it doing? Um, and so when you come to it, he's like, okay, so is it is it um, herbaceous? Is it soft or does it have wood? And we all pretty much know what wood is. We think of like a tree. Um, you think of like a pine tree, you think of the trunk, it's woody. Um, so that's what you want to notate. Is it is it woody? Does it have wood? Is it having this large central trunk that goes way up high? And oftentimes if it's going up high, it's quite large. Um, and has like a, a nice central woody uh, trunk to it, um, you're probably encountering a tree. Um, and that's what our group, groups are for what we think of it was a tree. Um, and then going down, if it's kind of smaller than a tree, um, uh, but that doesn't have necessarily a nice big central trunk to it, um, but it's woody throughout, but kind of much, much smaller than a tree, um, you're probably dealing with a shrub. Um, and then subshrub uh, kind of gets a gray hair. Yeah, subshrub is just literally something that's smaller than a shrub. So here's a picture of Erica Maria. Um, it's a nice shrub. But again, if you had something a little bit smaller than this, you could classify it as a subshrub. Um, again, it's kind of gets a little tricky in a kind of gray area. But again, if it's a subshrub, it's going to be kind of below the size of the shrub. Um, and again, all these trees, shrubs, and subshrubs tend to be perennial. So they're going to be around for a long time. Then you might encounter something, uh, you know, you're hiking, you encounter something that's uh, smaller. It doesn't have any signs, visible signs of wood or anything like that. Um, it's kind of soft, flexible. Um, you're probably dealing with something that's an herb or herbaceous plant. Um, and these can be broken down into kind of three um, kind of durations for these plants, uh, perennial. Uh, herbaceous plants, which, you know, they live for, they can live from anywhere from like three to four to maybe even a hundred years, depending on what it is. Um, but again, they have a longer lifespan. Um, then you might have a herbaceous plant that's a biennial, and these usually take, uh, you know, kind of coming back to the plant and observing it, because they might be, uh, you know, they come up, they're kind of leafy, uh, then you're like, okay, where's the flowers? They didn't do anything that year. Uh, so you might need to come back, and then you notice the next year, then it makes a flower stalk, does its flower, set seed, and then it's dead. So it only usually lives for two years, and that's our biennial herbaceous plants. Okay. Um, and then you might have might have something that comes up, um, and you notice through the whole year, it, you know, it, it goes, comes up, flowers, set seeds, and then it dies. Um, and that's our annual plants there, our herbaceous annual plants. Okay, and so we're going to jump right into leaves. So that would be your your next uh, kind of look at your plant. So you're looking, you got your kind of height measurements, you go, okay, tree, shrub, is it uh, perennial, is it herbaceous plant? Um, and then you're going to kind of tend to focus on the leaves. Um, and that's the most common characteristics of plants that we know of is leaves. Um, and so you're going to take it, you know, you look at your leaf and you check it out. You say, okay, um, does it have a blade? And that's the big green obvious part that's usually out there oriented towards the sun that we see a lot is the blade. Um, and that's that part highlighted in red there. So it goes from right about there to there. And then you might notice what's going on with the portion of the stalk that actually attaches to the plant, and that's called the petiole, which is a little tiny thing that comes off there. It can be long. It can actually be, actually, I take that, it can be extremely long to really short, um, or it can be lacking. Um, and then next, you might notice if there's uh, stipules, and stipules are like little modified leaves at the base of the petiole along the stem there. Um, and they can be, again, quite diverse. Um, they can have, you know, be serrated, they can have all these projections, or they can be absent. And it's good to notate if if there's stipules or not. Some keys, like especially for um, willow trees and stuff like that, uh, you know, stipules help a lot in identification. Um, and then your midrib, it's kind of like the support for the, the leaf itself. It runs up through the middle of the leaf. Um, it's it's uh, usually pretty straight, um, depending on the leaf. And then off that midrib, 
you might have some veins branching off of it. And those are the brains are the veins with this arrow coming off right here. Um, and you might have uh, veins. We'll talk about venation. It's really helpful. Um, and they're pretty obvious to see, especially if you hold a leaf up to the sun and you can kind of have it backlit. You can actually see the venation in there as well. And then your margin. We'll talk about that as well. Margin's really helpful. Um, what is it doing? You know, sometimes it's not doing anything and sometimes it can get really crazy and plants can do these really amazing things with just the margin of the leaf. Um, apex um, is referred to the top portion of the leaf. So usually kind of the tip top up here. And that can, again, that can take on a different shape or size or do stuff, um, you know, can actually be modified into uh, like a tendril or something. Uh, so it, 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 it's good to note that as well. And then the base, which kind of comes just right there where it touches the petiole. Um, and again, those that that portion of leaf uh, can actually be quite variable. So um, good things to just kind of notate when you're visually looking at the leaf. And then, so again, sorry, but I didn't mention that's a simple leaf. So that's just a kind of a, a picture of a simple leaf. Um, and then you leaves get can kind of get crazy uh, and they can become compound leaves. And it's called compound when they kind of look like they've gotten crazy. Um, and so our first kind of uh, compound leaf is our pinnate leaf. Um, which is uh, number one over here. And again, you have the same parts, but it's just kind of broken up. The leaf's broken up into other parts. So again, you have your petiole down here, and then you have your midrib going up here. But instead of the leaf being like completely together, it's broken up um, into segments. And these segments are actually called leaflets. Um, and they have venation. They'll have, um, it's kind of like a secondary midrib running up through the middle of it. Um, but this whole structure, this whole thing you see here right now is just one leaf. Um, these little individual things that are running up the side of it and around it are actually leaflets, but they're attached just to that one leaf. So they're all attached to that central midrib and it goes down. You can follow it down to a petiole, which then attaches to the stem. So you have a little stalk down here and that's all branched off on that there. So that makes one leaf. Then you have a palmate leaf, which is a little bit different. You have the petiole coming through here and then into the hand area. And um, it's kind of like little leaflets that are arranged around a central point. Um, and again, those are leaflets. They're not individual leaves. They're actually leaflets. And that whole structure right there is the leaf. Um, and then there's bipinnate. So it's just kind of, uh, you know, kind of taking pinnate and getting a little bit more fancier. Um, and so you can see on number three, same structure here, same kind of overall structure to the, uh, the leaf. But what's going on is these leaflets are further broken up even more. Um, so you have this part here and then this part here, and it's broken up even more. And I don't know, can you guys see my cursor? Can you see the little arrow? Okay, good, because I was hoping you could. Okay, great. Um, so it, this is broken up even more right here into, into indiv individual little tiny leaflets. Um, so it's bipinnate. So it has a secondary break in that those uh, leaflets there. And those are our compound leaves. And these uh, these two leaf shapes, palmate and bipinnate, are pretty common with um, your pea family. Um, so Fabiaceae, um, you'll see that a lot. And then this actually this pinnate leaf is actually from uh, black walnut. Um, they tend to have uh, the pinnate leaves there. Okay, so also with the leaves, you wanna make sure you're looking at um, both sides of the leaf. Um, you have the adaxial and that's referred to as the, the adaxial side. So your top half and the baxial, which is the bottom half. Um, and I, you know, I always made the error out in the field too when I was starting out first is you always just look at the top of the leaf and you're like, oh, this is really pretty. And you yet you don't really necessarily flip the leaf over. You think it just looks the same underneath. But oftentimes a lot of plants will have differences in between the adaxial side and the abaxial side. Sometimes they might have hairs on the bottom side. Um, sometimes they don't, they might have spines, um, you know, they, they might have some difference between the, so it's always good to look at both sides, notate what's going on on both sides. For example, this is a uh, bicolor nap phallium. It's a local one around here. Um, and it's called bicolor because the leaf is actually bicolor. The top is a different color from the bottom. And that's the reason being is that the bottom half of the leaf is actually covered in a dense dense uh, covering of hairs and gives it the bicolor look. Uh, but you wouldn't think that if you're just looking at the top, you're like, oh, I, I don't think this plant might have, you know, a dense covering hair because the top leaf doesn't really look like it has that many hairs to it. So good thing to just kind of look at both and notate what's going on. Um, and then a leaf attachment. So how the leaf attaches to the main uh, stem. So 
um, you can have, well, let's just get into it. We'll just go right into it. So um, how the leaf will attach the stem versus the um, sessile, which we'll talk to a little bit. So you have the main stem here and you have your leaves that are alternating. So they alternate up the stem, meaning that they're kind of uh, two ranked and they kind of go, here's a leaf. You'll have a little gap between the next leaf and then it's on the other side. So it's two ranked going up the stem and that's called alternating. So the leaves are alternating up the stem. Then you can have opposite leaves where you can have leaves that are um, just literally opposite of, uh, of each other. So that's like an example number two. They'll just be on opposite side. And again, I wanted to mention where the leaf comes out of the stem, it's called the node. And that'll be helpful to know too. It's where the node where it actually comes out. Um, and then number three, which is world, um, that's, that's just a whole bunch of leaves that are just kind of connected at one point going around the stem. So it's world. And I kind of tried to get the best back look picture so you guys can kind of see it too. It's like, here's the main stem in the middle and the leaves are kind of uh, positioned around it, kind of like the spokes of a wheel. Um, that's called world. And then fascicled, you don't see as much in the field, um, at least around here, but plants can do it. Um, and uh, it's just, it's essentially kind of like if you were to take a, like an umbrella and you just kind of push all your leaves up and then condense them down. And they kind of just all hang out together in clusters here. And these fascicles are kind of like fan shaped um, along the stem there too. Uh, and then clasping, there's uh, the base of the leaf. So leaf attachment to stem can be uh, clasping. There's these, uh, hoping this picture shows it the best is the, um, the, the base of the blade of the leaf actually hugs. It's like it's giving the stem a nice hug. Um, and that's really helpful in uh, notating that as well, because that can be a really key characteristic in your plant identification. It might say, well, are the leaves clasping or are they decurrent, which is the next one, number six there. Um, does the base of the leaf kind of touch the stem and then go down it. So it doesn't hug it, but it goes down it. Um, and you can see that on this one here. So the, the base of the leaf makes contact with the stem and then a portion of it kind of comes down. And if you take the leaf off the plant, um, you'll notice that, uh, and you can do it just right, you can actually get the part of the leaf that goes down the decurrent part right here. And you can actually see that at the base of the leaf there. Um, okay, again, uh, your leaf attachment. So along the stem, it can be uh, petioled or sessile. So um, well, how the leaf is uh, literally just connected to the stem. And oftentimes you have plants that are petioled, they'll have the little petiole that is projecting off the stem with the blade, um, or they'll just be smack dab right on the stem and there'll be sessile. And that's called sessile and you can see that in this, they're just literally just connected right into it. There's no like um, distinguishing between the blade and the petiole, it's just kind of right to it. Um, okay, leaf margins, like I was mentioning before, um, leaf margins typically get, uh, you know, can get really fancy, especially around in arid environments and semi-arid environments. So you can get a lot of cool kind of looks to the sides and the margins of the leaves. Um, but for most plants, uh, entire is kind of the kind of the route that goes. Um, an entire is is just exactly that. So we're looking at we're looking at the margin here, and what's going on there. And uh, magnification helps as well as um, you know putting it under a dissecting microscope and having it backlit helps to really see it. And these are what these photos come from. Um, this is entire. So entire leaf margin is pretty much what it's it's saying. It's entire. There's no like any any part of the margin that gets broken up or it has a point or anything like that, it's just complete, it's just entire. Um, the next is serrated. Um, and serrated, I love, I love serrated leaves. I like that funky kind of punky kind of neat look to the to the leaf margin. Um, and often can be very sharp, they can be spines and they're just, there's a projection, there's a, a nice defined projection. And there's variation to leaf serration, we won't go into that, just know that if it has some like teeth or some uh, points along the margin, it's serrated. Um, and then crinunate is kind of, um, kind of just kind of scalloped. The margin is kind of scalloped, it's really nice and smooth and kind of just kind of scalloped along the margin there. So. Um, and then now looking at the overall leaf shapes, kind of what leaves can do, the diversity in leaves, um, and it's good to notate as well. Um, it helps with your identification. So we're just gonna just do a quick look at these. Um, lanceolate number one is lanceolate. Um, it typically, uh, where the, the term goes for the leaf is kind of like what's going on with the leaf. So we're like, where's the widest point versus the smallest point? Where is it narrowing to? So lanceolate typically, 
uh, it tends to be kind of broadest near the base here, and then it kind of tapers to a point. Nine per day. And then um, elliptic is tend to be wider towards the middle here, and you can actually see it kind of tapers to a point there and kind of tapers down and gets narrow towards the bottom. Uh, let's see, ovate, uh, again, is kind of like lanceolate, but broader. You have a bigger base and then coming to a point at the tip. Linear, um, you see that a lot in arid environments, the leaves will get really narrow and uh, kind of straight, and that's number four there. Um, and then oval number five is kind of more of kind of an oval shape. Um, and then dissected for number six, uh, it's just kind of taking the leaf and then just lobing it. It gets really lobed and these lobes can be very shallow or they can be, um, uh, or way, way deep. And if they're way, way deep, it's called dissected. And then I put deltate in there uh, just because I'm a fan of deltate. Um, it's kind of like a short, chunky kind of triangular shape. Um, and then lobed, which I had mentioned, uh, lobed is kind of, there's just kind of has a little bit of a kind of like a um, kind of moving in along the leaf and it's kind of lobe coming, coming out here. This is a verbena and it's kind of lobed at the base here. So you have a little projection that comes out here and then it goes back to the main leaf. So it's lobed. All right, uh, leaf shapes continued. So this one, um, these uh, are kind of just looking at some other shapes you can see out there. So um, perfoliate is just kind of a neat one. You'll see it a lot in miner's lettuce. Um, you have the stem and it kind of looks like it just been poked right through the center of a circular uh, circular leaf um, and that's perfoliate. And then uh, undulate, um, you might see on some, some leaf um, shape is it just kind of looks like it's been undulated. It's kind of has these waviness to it. Um, you can see this is uh, actually a sugar bush and it has a nice kind of undulated look to it. And you can see on the side view of it, you can see how the, the leaf margin is really undulated uh, with the whole structure of the leaf. And then um, you can have the margins curled under here, like in this example, um, and they can be really drastic, the curving under, or it can be very minimal. Um, and then convex um, is just kind of a, you know, just a minor bend. This is actually lemonade berry and it, it kind of has slight convex leaves where they kind of just kind of bend down a little bit and tried to get as best a picture to show that come from the leaf or the front of the leaf. And you can kind of see it just has a slight bend to it. They are curving down. Okay, and then leaf bases. Um, again, with that bottom part of the blade, uh, what is it doing? And plants can do some really cool things with the base. Um, there's examples chordate here kind of comes down and makes these kind of two humps that kind of come down almost sometimes a lot of uh, folks refer to it as kind of like a heart shape kind of coming to the top of a heart um, and then obtuse um, is uh, oh sorry I'm sorry one second so this is our, our our apex over here and then this is our base sorry about that so the the base the chordate is the base and then rounded the base can be a rounded shape um, and then your apex of so the top of the leaf um, can do some stuff as well. And then here's just two examples this is obtuse to acute. Um, and oftentimes, you know, the, the tip can also be rounded or it can come to a point or it can also do some other things too. So just notating kind of what that leaf's doing at the tip. And then leaf venation. Um, there, there's a lot to venation, but a, a, a great uh, just kind of simplification to it is, is it netted? Meaning that is there are lots of veins just originating from this center vein here, or are the veins just all straight up and down? And that's called parallel venation or netted venation. And those are two helpful things. Um, parallel venation is often seen in monocots. Um, netted venation, you'll have, a, you know, again, that center vein here going up the middle, which is the midrib. And then you have these secondary veins that kind of originate off that. And if you get a little bit close, you can almost see it you'll see these tertiary veins, which are these other little tiny veins that connect it all together. It just kind of looks like a netted pattern. And then the parallel venation, you can see in this photograph, it's just kind of straight venations going up and down. And a lot, a lot of times you see that in grasses and stuff like that. If you hold a leaf up, if you ever played with grass and you, you know, hold it up to the sun, uh, you can actually see the venation really easily um, in the leaf blade. Um, okay, so something I'm really fascinated about uh, with plant identification, and it helps a lot too to know, um, is ves, uh, ves, 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 vesiture, sorry, uh, trichomes or hairs, plant hairs is often re uh, referred to. Uh, it's kind of like what, uh, what's going on at these little projections uh, that cover the plants. Um, and they're totally fascinating. They can come in all shapes and sizes and they do a lot for the plant. It's, it's quite incredible what, uh, 
what hairs can do for a plant. Um, and they can come, hairs can be simple um, or they can be unbranched. They can be branched or forked. They can be um, found on, you know, fruits, leaves, stems, um, and they can be also interwoven. They can be hooked and barbed. They can look pretty gnarly. Um, and again, these are these are these can be very large structures, or they can be very minute structures that oftentimes you'll see under a hand lens. Um, so again, it's helpful to have that loop. And uh, Keys will ask you, you know, what's going on in the surface leaf? Is the um, is is the hairs branching on it? Are they dense? Are they not so dense? You know, so it's it's mindful to notate kind of what's going on with the hairs. Um, and so I'm just going to do a little kind of quick look at some of the hairs here. Um, so this is a cryptantha flower. Um, if you've ever come across a cryptantha flower, they just look really burly and covered with all these sharp hairs and sharp spines. Um, and that's exactly what's going on. So if you were to, to excuse me, do a close up of the, the, the leaves, they actually, um, or of the flower, you can actually see along the um, part right here, which is called the calyx, which we'll talk about. Um, they have these really sharp, defined uh, hairs that come to a sharp point. And a lot of times these hairs are deter um, herbivory. Um, they might uh, deter, you know, things from climbing on them. Um, so it's it's oftentimes very sharp for defense. And that's an example for uh, Cryptantha there. And then you might see some really cool hairs over here um, that inflate, these hairs will inflate. Um, and they oftentimes feel mealy. So if you've ever done a lot with weeding, um, and especially like pigweeds and stuff like that, and you pull them out and you're like, wow, that feels so like, like a mealy feeling or kind of weird kind of feeling. It's actually these inflated hairs. And what happens over time is these inflated hairs will actually collapse on themselves and kind of form like this scale network across the surface of the leaf. Um, and then you can have glandular hairs. Um, which is seen in the telegraph weed. You can have these really elaborate glandular hairs. And again, for defense, um, maybe to prevent a herbivore or an insect, something they burrow into that, into that plant. Um, and then over here, you might have uh, the surface of the leaf look different because it's covered in a density of hair. So this is a milkweed, uh, Indian milkweed. And the reason it's got this really kind of, it's like a, a grayish blue look to it is it's covered in a dense interwoven um, uh, branching of these just simple hairs, which is seen down in this picture here. Um, and then they can be found on fruits. So these are examples of founding, or uh, sorry, on flowers. Um, and kind of an interesting one on these is, uh, this is Mara, um, wild cucumber from around here, and then coyote melon on the bottom. It's kind of interesting. They have on the inside of the uh, flower along the kind of uh, top part of the um, corolla, they have these little projections, these glandular hairs. Um, that are just covering them. So if you ever look closely with a hand lens on the inside of uh, wild cucumber flower, you'll notice these little tiny projections. Um, and then down on coyote, but I'm not too sure what these trichomes are really used for, uh, it, but they're wild looking. They look like little tiny worms that come out the top. And these are just, they're stacked little hairs. Um, they look like they're a little uh, stacked. They might be multicellular uh, stacked hairs that come off the inside, again, on the inside of that. And that Again, I'm not too sure what they, if anybody knows what they're used for, I'd love to know. Um, a lot of sometimes trichomes, they, you can kind of infer like what they might be used for, but um, unless if somebody's done a study on, we're not too sure what they're used for. Um, and again, I have no idea what those hairs, if anybody knows, I'd love to know. Um, and then glandular hairs um, can be really helpful for deterring um, herbivores like insects. Um, again, this is an example of a verbena. Um, along the stems and it's glandular and you'll see these glandular hairs. So there's kind of just a stalk with this blob on the top um, and that's a glandular hair. And it, it the glandular, the blob part might hold, um, you know, secondary stuff that uh, again, might taste bad, might have a smell to it, or it might be sticky in the case of like carnivorous plants. Um, and this is the case for this verbena. You can see this little dot right here is an insect and if you get closer, these hairs actually um, help to trap the insect. Um, and usually that insect gets stuck there and then dies. So it's again, a, a defense um, from herbivory. Um, and then stinging nettle, uh, it's kind of iconic, you know, everyone kind of knows stinging nettle and uh, it's iconic because the hairs, there's these hairs that act like hypodermic needles that are on the surface of the plant. And again, you know, you might not even see them, but you have to get close to them. And you actually can, you can see them with a normal hands. This is just actually a backlit photo of the, um, 
uh, uh, hair itself. That's the actual stinging hair. Um, and it's a really fascinating. There's a, there's like a little pump down below here. It's, um, and then this part is kind of hollow filled and it fills up with the formic acid and it, it acts like a needle. You come across it, brush the grunts of your skin and it, it injects that formic acid and gives you that, that irritation. Um, so again, these hairs, you know, you don't see them, but they're doing a lot to help the plant. Um, and then over here you have, um, brassicas tend to have these, um, these uh, called stellate hairs, which are these, you know, branched, and then they have this like radial kind of star kind of shape to the top of it. And those again um, are common in brassica. So you might see that a lot with uh, in keys. And then you can have scale hairs and you can have, um, here's those barbed and hooked hairs. So menzelia, um, again, here's just an example of this hair here. They actually can have these really, really prominent projections um, that actually will detach. So if you've ever, uh, you know, come across a menzelia, um, trying to think of a uh, blazing star family, um, they, uh, they tend to stick to your clothing really well. It's because of these barbed hairs. Um, and literally sometimes you get it on, and you can't almost get it off because it just gets so stuck in there. Um, but again, dispersal might help with dispersal and stuff like that, these hairs um, being attached and stuff. And then a great example on the fruit is our local lemonade berry. Um, what you talk about is not actually a berry, it's a droop. So, um, uh, but these 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 fruits that lemonade berry produce um, are quite fascinating and uh, and amazing. Uh, so, but they have glandular hairs. The fruits the um, plants can put hairs on on fruits to do stuff too. And for example, for the lemonade berry, these glandular hairs they have up here that lie in the outside of the fruit. Um, and what we all know about lemonade berries, they secrete this kind of resinous kind of uh, substance on the outside that we like to suck on. Um, and those are produced by the glands on the outside of the fruit. They secrete it. And actually, I think I have a shot. Yeah, here it goes. Um, you can actually see as the fruit starting to develop. So it's been uh, pollinated, the ovary starting to enlarge, it's starting to grow and get bigger. Um, the glands will at one stage will start to secrete and you can actually see the goo that resinous stuff being secreted by the glands um, and then it, it gets concentrated more and more and more and then you get that characteristic look of the lemonade berry fruits um, and that kind of dissipates but it stays there but again um, not too sure no one I don't think really knows uh, what for sure that resin does for the uh, for the outside of the fruit um, again if anybody knows um, I'd love to know, but I, I haven't found any good papers or anything out there that talk about what those function. We know that they secrete it and it makes it, but we, uh, what does it do? What is it? It's, you know, thoughts are deters, you know, things from burrowing into it. Who knows? There's some other cool things about lemonade berry fruits with uh, certain insects and stuff like that. So who knows? So, but again, it's produced by these glandular hairs, which are very tiny. And then again, if you amplify it on a large area, all these hairs, they can really do a lot for a plant. Okay, um, back to your leaves. Um, and then some leaves might have a waxy cuticle. Um, and that makes what makes the leaf um, really thick and tough. Um, again, lemonade berry has that waxy cuticle. And you see if you do a cross section, a key might ask you, is it a soft leaf or is it a thick leathery leaf? Um, does it have a cuticle on there? And sometimes you can actually scratch the outside of a leaf and it almost looks like wax on it. Uh, lemonade berry is well known for having waxy leaves. You can see the top half, this is a cross section through the leaf. You can see that thin layer of wax deposited on the top half, not on the bottom half there too. And that's with, with help with water loss and stuff. So um, it's good to notate that as well. Um, so jumping into flowers. So moving on to flowers. Um, they're diverse. That's all I can say. They, I mean, plants have just done it. I mean, they have made so many shapes and forms to flowers. It's incredible. Um, again, the, the colors, the shapes, the pattern, it's just amazing. Plants do it, angiosperms do it really well um, and quite diverse. And it, this is just a snippet of some of the flowers out there. Um, and so we're just going to talk about the basic parts of a flower, um, just to get familiar with the basic parts, which help with identification. Um, oh, and I also want to notate there are aquatic flowers. So there are flowers in water. Uh, don't forget about the water environments. There's definitely uh, flowering plants in water environments. Um, one of the smallest flowers that we know of is uh, in the duckweed family, and that's up over here. This is actually, I couldn't find a picture of, it's the genus uh, Wolfie, if I remember correctly, has the smallest flower, and they uh, are aquatic plants, and you can see that's the tip of my finger, and that's, that's not Wolfie, that's um, 
um, limna, the duckweed, just a normal duckweed, but they're a little bit smaller than that, but they produce flowers. And they have the, if you look at the flower, they have the same structure as all other flowers, but just maybe a little bit different. Um, aquatic, so in freshwater, uh, Potamogeton, here's a freshwater example. There's flowers there, they're submerged. And then even in the ocean, uh, along the shoreline, we have flowering plants. And uh, surf grass is a great one. And if, if you hike around the Palos Verdes Peninsula, you ever go on a low tide, you get just blown away by the surf grass. It's really, really beautiful. And they produce uh, flowers a little bit different. Um, and they're kind of separated. The, the, the female flowers and the boy flowers or the uh, male flowers are kind of separated on different, different inflorescence, but they do the same thing. They produce um, pollen, which is kind of this weird gelatinous mixture that kind of oozes out and then uh, floats and comes in contact with uh, the uh, pistolate flower, the, the uh, female flower part, um, which is here. And it, again, they have the same structures, which we'll go over, but just a little bit different. So I just wanted to do a shout out to our aquatic environment. Um, so before we get into flower parts, uh, flower symmetry, uh, so kind of how the flower um, is, how you can divide it if it's equal halves um, when you're dividing it. So you have radial symmetry, and that one is just, you have equal parts that are kind of just um, circled around a central point. And if you were to dissect it or cut it, you can cut in to um, equal halves in more than one plane. Um, and that's often sometimes also referred to as a tinomorphic or regular flower. It's just a regular flower, looks like a regular flower. Then you have what's called bilateral flowers. You may see that a lot if you grow beans and stuff like that. Uh, the flowers, um, they're, they're kind of off. You're like, oh, it doesn't look like a normal, like, you know, like rose flower or something like that. It's kind of a little weird. Um, it doesn't have that nice radial symmetry to it. It's called bilateral symmetry. And it means that if you go to dissect it, you'll have two equal halves, but just only along one plane. Um, and that's often uh, referred to as zygomorphic or irregular flowers. Then you can have another example. Um, oh, yeah had those in there. Um, again, showing the, the how you would cut it um, equal sides. Um, asymmetrical. So flowers can kind of get a little weird and they just kind of look off shape. Um, and they don't have radial symmetry and they don't have bilateral symmetry. They just have this weird shape. You know, like, oh, I don't really know. It's, it's asymmetrical. Um, so there's no plane of symmetry. You can't really divide that up to equal halves. Okay, flower parts. So um, here's a, a picture of just basic flower parts. Um, and the first thing you want to kind of notate is what's going on with the female part of the flower. So the female part is your ovary here. So usually kind of the part that contains the eggs. Then you have this part here, which is your style. And that's the tube where uh, when the pollen gets deposited, it grows down into. And then you have a stigma up here, which receives the pollen. Um, so that's that part right here. And that's the uh, female part of the plant. And then on the outside of the plant, you might see um, some structures uh, that are kind of green and they kind of are just before you see those really colorful parts, which are the petals, those are called your sepals and they're um, usually positioned below uh, the petals there. And then um, jumping up here, you'll have the, the boy parts, um, which are the anthers and the filament, which is collectively known as the stamen. So you have this part right here. This is the filament and then this is the anther and this is the part that produces the pollen. Um, and then again, usually um, Going around that is your petals, and they're usually colorful. Um, there are sometimes where petals aren't actually colorful, or there can be petals completely gone, um, but usually they're colorful. And then um, there's collective terms for all those. So, um, you know, your female whole part right here, it can collectively, all those parts can be known as the pistil or the carpal. Um, and then all the petals collectively are known as the corolla. And then um, your, your uh, uh, male parts, your, your anther and your filaments are collectively known as the stamen. Um, and then your calyx or, or your, or, sorry, your sepals are collectively known as your calyx. So it's kind of collective terms. Um, and oftentimes, at least my, my experience, keys tend to use the collective terms unless they're really getting specific about what's going on one individual petal or something like that or are they on one individual sepal but usually they reference the collective terms so getting familiar with those collective terms and then what supports the whole flower is often uh, referred to as the pedestal so it's that part that's kind of like when you're holding a flower and you're like oh there's the flower on top it's the pedestal it's the little kind of thing you hold um, and here's some uh, in the field examples of what we were just talking about. Um, sometimes it's really helpful to see it in the field. Um, so here's your pet, your corolla or your, your petals up here. And this is of calicortis. Um, and then uh, showing, and this is showing from the side. 
And then you have the calyx here, which are these parts here. Um, and again, they're not that colorful. They usually tend to be green color, um, kind of almost look like leaves sometimes. Um, and that's the calyx or your sepals. And then if you were to take that calicordus flower and look down on it, uh, you'd look inside and here's your petals surrounding it. And then you'd look down and you notice these structures down below and those are the, the reproductive structures down in there. Um, so you have, if you get closer with it, you can actually see here's our, our carpal or our pistil. They're right there. There's this actually the stigmas right there. Um, and then you'd have your, um, your stamens, which are here, and they're often really cool color. Uh, the anther, this part right here is often pinkish color, um, but those are your stamens and they usually are surrounded, uh, surrounding the um, carpal. And then another example is Datura. Um, it's just these flowers are nice and big and you can really feel like, yes, I know these terms when you see the, when you see these um, examples on the bigger flowers, it gets a little tricky on the smaller flowers. So bigger flowers, um, like a Datura flower, you can actually really see the calyx here. And then uh, this is just the green part right here. And then coming up to that really beautiful trumpet shaped kind of um, corolla, really gorgeous flower. If you've, if you've seen Daturas in the field um, and very big, uh, which is nice when you're trying to learn your, your, flor or your floral parts. Um, and again, if you take that flower, look down on it on the top, you'd see in the middle, there's these reproductive structures and there's your stamens. Um, right here, and then there's your carpal. Um, and we go down a little bit more down here, so you're just seeing the style and the stigma up above there. Um, okay, so again, just an overview. Here's a nice uh, cross section through a flower, and you can actually see it a little bit more in detail. The female reproductive part, you can actually see the stigma, the style, and here's the ovary, how it's positioned and stuff. Um, and then another thing to be uh, just familiar with with plant identification are tepals. Um, you might hear that or read it in a key. And tepals are just kind of, they're kind of like, um, you can't really distinguish between the calyx and the, or the, um, the sepals and the petals. There's kind of like, you're looking at the flower and you're like, where does it, where does the, the sepals begin and where do they stop and where does the petals begin? They just kind of look like they all are just the same. Um, and that's oftentimes those, those are tepals you're looking at. And uh, you see that a lot in like um, the cactus family on the flowers. When you look at if you look ever look at a cactus flower, you can't really distinguish the, um, the uh, sepals from the petals. They're all really showy and colorful. Um, and those are the tepals, collectively you know, kind of the tepals. So I just wanted to throw that out there just to kind of have that um, there as well with um, going through a key or something. Um, and then we're going to talk about, so again, how that ovary and that, uh, so the carpal and the pistil is positioned in the flower is really important. Um, what, where is it? You know, where is it in the flower? Um, and you might hear or read, especially when you're beginning with plant families in a key, like if you're working with the Jepson manual and you're going through keys, um, you're kind of your first part of the key is going to be, they're going to be talking about like, okay, well, how many, um, you know, how many petals does it have? How many um, sepals does it have? Uh, you know, what are they doing? And then also, ask, oh, is it superior ovary or is it an inferior ovary? Um, and there's one other thing I'll talk about. Um, in the next slide is it doing? And that's just talking about what, where is the ovary positioned in the flower um, in relations to the, all the other uh, floral parts. So um, in a superior ovary, the ovary kind of is superior. It kind of sits on top of everything else. So your, uh, your stamens, uh, the petals, the calyx are all connected below the ovary. So below this part right here, they're all kind of originating from below it. And that's uh, referred to as a superior ovary superior. It's on top of those parts. Um, inferior ovary is again exactly the opposite. It's just inferior to all those parts. So it usually sits below the attachment of all those parts. So you can see in this one, all those parts are actually attached on top of the ovary and the ovary is inferior to those parts. Um, and let's see, here's some in the field examples. Like say, if you're looking at something and running through the key, uh, your superior ovary versus your inferior ovary. This is again, Cryptantha um, in the uh, superior ovaries for those guys. And so you can see it, um, here's our um, corolla and you have your stamens that are attached to the corolla. They're actually fused to the corolla, but they're all, all those parts are originating and come from below the um, ovary, which is, Hope everybody can see it. It's a little tricky on the photo, but it's this part right here. And there's your stigma style and there's the ovaries. And these parts are actually attaching below the ovary there. Um, and so that's a superior ovary versus on the other side, which is Menzelia flower, that they have inferior ovaries. Um, and you have your placement again of those floral parts are kind of attached 
above. So here's the ovary. And then the styles in there, it's hard to see, it's kind of lost in the um, in the stamens. But again, uh, it's right here. And then, so that's your, your pistil and then your ovaries here. Um, and then your attachment of the other floral parts are around, but they're attached to the top of the ovary up there. And that's inferior. So it's kind of a, a kind of infield example to kind of see it. And again, you'll need to do cross sections uh, through a flower, which doesn't, don't get alarmed by, it's, it's very straightforward. Again, a nice razor blade or something, or if it's a big flower, you can just use scissors and you can cut through it. And it's a simple cross section. You just kind of just cut it in half and you can look at how the attachment of the floral parts, it's nothing too tricky or anything like that. It gets a, maybe a little tricky on small flowers, but you should be able to determine it um, pretty quickly. And then there's another thing I'm going to mention, gets a little bit tricky, it's called a hypanthium, um, and you'll see that a lot like in uh, rosaceae, your rose families, um, and a, a couple other families as well, uh, where it, it's, it's a, I'm just going to touch on it, it's a little bit tricky, it's the, the tissues that hold up the other floral parts, like your calyx, uh, your corolla, and your stamens and stuff like that, they're attached to different tissue that come off below the ovary over here. So it's part of actually the stalk that supports the flower and they're attached to that. And then your ovaries just kind of like alone hanging in the middle there and just kind of like not, those aren't attached anywhere. And it kind of, it kind of almost forms a cup and there's variation on a hypanthium, but this is kind of just the straightforward hypanthium. And then that's where the ovary sits is in this cup. And those, those floral parts are attached to that. And that's called a hypanthium, which again is, is useful to know that they're out there, especially if you're coming across like something in rosaceae, the rose family and stuff like that, they have a lot of hypanthiums in that. So, and that often will, uh, um, that hypanthium will be what surrounds the ovary and may swell um, like a rose hip or something like that, that colorful portion and stuff like that. Um, here's an example in the field of rosaceae. So again, you do a cross section through the flower. Um, you have, again, uh, your floral parts here. Here's these individual things in here. These are the, the ovaries. Um, and then rose, rose, roses get really tricky in there. It's really congested, but here's You've got your stigmas here, and then these are your styles going down to your ovaries, and then your stamens are these kind of like things coming out this side here, and your petals and your calyx are all attached. But if you notice, they're all attached to this kind of tissue that runs along down around here, and it's connected down into this part down here, and that's forming that cup around that. So there's the hypanthium, and then you can often see it down here, and that's a part that'll kind of swell up when you think of a rose hip. Um, and the the um, when you open a rose hip, those little kind of like hard parts that are like, that you think are the seeds inside that, that's actually the fruit. So the hypanthium is not actually the fruit, um, the solemn part, it's the little tiny things within them, which are the, um, the uh, fruits themselves inside that. So, uh, okay, and the corolla types uh, and floral shapes. Uh, so you can have petals that are free. So you're looking at your flower um, and your corolla might have these breaks in it and your your petals are distinct you can see them and you can see there's there's a break between them those are petals it's called referred to as petals free and that goes for your calyx as well so your sepals they can be free um, or they can fuse them so again plants get kind of kind of tricky with their plant their uh, their uh, reproductive parts they do some really cool stuff they can fuse it and they fuse it and then they can elongate it can be short it can have all these different shapes to it um, and sorry you know what I actually have cruciform in there and that's not fused. Sorry about that. Um, that should be over on the free uh, section over there. Um, so if they're fused, they're going to fuse together and make different shapes. And I'm just, I'm just showing you some basic uh, fused shapes. So you have rotate. It's kind of a, it's short, kind of rotate. Um, here's examples like a facilia. Tubular, um, this is the best example of tubular. It, it is a tubular flower, but the tip is not exactly uh, doing what a tubular should. Um, kind of flayed out a little bit and there's another uh, term for them. But overall, tubular is typically a longer flower that's kind of tubular. Those are often used, usually uh, red, hummingbird, um, pollinated. You want something long with long beak or something to come in. Um, and then ursulate, which is kind of an urn shape. You think of manzanitas, there's kind of this nice urn shape to it, um, but it's fused. Uh, the corolla, and then your funnel form, which you think of like your morning glories, they have a nice funnel form kind of shaped fused uh, corolla there. And then again, the brassica flower here should be over on the petals free, and those 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 petals are free over there. And that's cruciform, which is kind of like a, a cross shape, very characteristic of um, your brassicas, the brassica family and stuff. Um, how are we doing on see Okay. Uh, types of flowers, there's complete flowers and incomplete flowers. 
Um, and this, this is referring to if the flower has all the floral parts or not. So some flowers can have, you know, have all, all the parts to it. So they can have the calyx, they can have the corolla, they can have the stamens, they have the pistil, you know, they have the, all the parts um, or they, they don't, or they might lack one or more parts. So your complete flowers have all the parts, your incomplete flowers. Um, so they might have, they might be lacking one or more parts um, to it. And that again is just getting, kind of getting up close with your flower and seeing what's going on in there. Um, and then with your flowers, you can have, bisexual flowers, um, and those are referred to as perfect flowers, and bisexual flowers have both uh, sexes present in the flower. So they have both the female part and the male part. And then unisexual flowers um, are often referred to as, or imperfect flowers, um, they only have one sex present in the flower. So they can have either your male parts in one flower, and then in the next, and then in another flower, they'll have just the female uh, part present. Um, and I put example of, you know, uh, your, uh, I think, oh yeah, salt bush here. Um, and they have staminate flowers and pistil flowers, and that's referring to that unisexual flower. So they only, when you look at the, the male part one flower, they only have stamens. There's no carpal, there's no, um, no female part present in the flower. And then uh, exact, you know, the exact opposite with the female flowers, they don't have any stamens, um, any of that present. They're also incomplete flowers because they lack uh, um, other floral parts. Uh, so they're kind of a little bit different. But takeaway from that is that just look at the flower and it might be lacking one or more parts, which is very helpful in keys. And then um, monoecious versus dioecious. So how those plants um, are presenting those flowers. So monoecious essentially has so they have separate separate flowers. They have boy flowers and girl flowers, but they're on the same plant, um, and that's monoecious. Dioecious. Some plants will do it where they'll have individuals that are just male, so they produce only male flowers, and then they might have um, female female plants that only produce. Uh, female flowers. And again, this is just getting down and looking at the flower um, and seeing what's going on in there. And a great example is coyote brush. Um, they are uh, dioecious. So if you look at it, you're like, hey, why does that coyote brush look like that? And you have another one maybe just down the trail and it looks, you're like, what's going on there with the flowers? They look different. It, it's because they, they are, they're different. They're, there's male flowers and female flowers and different plants. And your females are the ones that get really nice and fluffy and produce the fruits. And when they get covered, it looks like snow or something like that. And then the boys, you know, they'll have nice flowers, but then they kind of brown out and they kind of look not so good after they're just doing their thing. Um, so that's dioecious. Not all plants do that. Um, some will have, you know, all the sex on the same plant um, or the, all the floral parts in the same flower on the same plant. And then vestigial flower, floral parts, which I just want to touch a little bit on that because it's tricked me up a lot with when you're running through identification, when they ask, okay, well, does it have all the floral parts or does it not? Is it lacking? Um, so example is lemonade berry. So lemonade berries are uh, typically and mostly uh, dioecious. Um, so they will have, uh, there's boy plants and there's girl plants. And if you go out and hiking along the peninsula, uh, the Palos Verdes Peninsula, you'll notice there's some that make fruit and some don't, and those are the boys and the girls. Um, and if you go, if you look at the flower um, and do a cross section, you'll notice that um, they have the carpal here. It's right here, but it looks just shrunken, like something happened to it. And it doesn't look like it should be functional. And that's because it's not, it's called a vestigial. It's just a remnant. It's not completely gone. It's just non-functional. Okay. Okay, great. Um, and so, uh, so that's just a staminate flower. And then hopping over to here, uh, you'll notice that the, um, it's reversed for the pistolate flower. You have the uh, fully functional, it's really, really nice and big uh, carpal, it's, it's, it's functional. And then you'll notice these little tiny things that look like raisins down below on these stalks. And you're like, what are those? And those are vestigial stamens. So they're, they're there, but they're not functional. They're vestigial. So they're not actually doing anything. So technically they don't, they're not functional. So they don't, they don't really have them. So um, it can be a little bit tricky when you're looking in the flower, like especially the stamina flower, you're like, oh, that looks bisexual. It's got both, but it, it doesn't. So again, just getting down and cross, doing a cross section and really poking around in there. Um, inflorescence types. So um, we have uh, spikes and heads and helicoid cymes, um, solitary. These are just examples of different inflorescence types. 
um, catkins and compound amble. And I'm going to speed up just a little bit to cover slides. I think we're getting close on time. Um, and essentially for inflorescence, it's how the flowers are arranged on that inflorescence. Um, and I'll talk a little bit just about the head. So a head is um, pretty common in, in Asteraceae, your sunflower family. Um, and they have two different types of flowers in there. So it, it's actually, um, it's a whole bunch of little flowers stuck on this big thing that looks like one single flower. Um, and then another one I want to touch on is umbels. Umbels are kind of just, uh, you'll have an inflorescence, you'll have a stalk and you have these little tiny little stalks coming off that and then that's supporting the flower. Um, that's an umbel. And then you might see a lot in um, ABACA carrot family. Um, compound umbels, which are just umbels of umbels. So it looks like a whole bunch of umbels just stuck on one inflorescence and that's a compound umbel. Spikes, usually the flowers are just, just uh, attached right to uh, the stalk that's holding up the inflorescence. So the actual inflorescence are just attached right to it. And then um, fruit types, um, different types out there. Uh, you have simple fruits, you have complex fruits, um, simple fruits. Tim, you know, example is like a berry and a berry has, um, it's usually it's fleshy. Um, it doesn't get hard. There's some examples, some, you know, like a banana is a berry. They can have a kind of a leathery rind on the outside, but typically they're fleshy, fleshy and they have a lot of seeds in them. Um, and so that's examples like solanum. They make berries actually. And then your lemonade berries aren't berries, they're droops. And droops are interesting because they have a little fleshy outside, but they have a stony uh, center. And that center then uh, is what surrounds the seed. It's like you got a little fleshy, stony, and then the seed supported in that little thing. And that's uh, lemonade berries have droops and that's a droop type. So that type of uh, um, fruit there. And then complex fruits like your, your blackberries, uh, your California blackberry, uh, it's just a complex fruit or an aggregate fruit is all these little tiny fruits um, kind of clustered together and stuck together. And it looks like one big fruit, but each individual little part right there is actually um, a droop actually, it's actually a droop um, that's all collected together. So if you've ever bit into a blackberry and you, you bite into one little tiny section, there's that little stony part that you think is the seed. That's actually the, the stony part with is it, which is in within the droop there. So it's kind of interesting, but it's a way of presenting numerous fruits, but that's a complex fruit. Um, there's dry fruits um, and there's a whole diversity of dry fruits as well. Um, and they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, usually with dry fruits, some dry fruits will dehisce, meaning that they'll break open to disperse the seeds or they're indehiscent, meaning that they won't break open to disperse the seed. Um, and again, uh, you might be familiar with dehiscent with like a legume and the pea family. Um, an indehiscent would be like a nut or an akeen for like a, a sunflower seed. The um, fruit is an akeen. Actually doesn't open up to disperse the seed. Actually, like if you ever eat sunflower seed, you have to, you know, crack it open to get to the seed in the center. And they don't, the uh, uh, plant itself, they don't uh, crack open and disperse the seed that stays together. So, uh, okay, I think, are we, are we okay on time doing? We're doing okay, but um, probably. Getting close. Yeah, getting close. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to skip grasses We've got and a great ferns. variety of stuff. It's really uh, quite, quite enlightening. Yeah, that's what I was, yeah. I'm going to skip grasses and ferns. Um, I'm going to jump to, uh, I could talk a, a little bit about bryophytes. Um, again, they're uh, non-vascular seedless plants uh, and they produce spores. So again, that's kind of what your characteristics for your bryophytes are. Um, they have rhizoids. So these are those structures that anchor the plant. Um, they don't function as roots. Uh, they more function just for anchoring. Um, and here's like a stem coming off. And these are these uh, little red things are the rhizobes. They usually originate on the bottom half of of um, the bryophyte or whatever in particular one you're looking at. Um, there's a uh, gametophyte stage, which is the dominant stage, which is what you think of when you look at like bryophytes, that really leafy stage, when you think of like a moss or something like that. Uh, that's the gametophyte stage, which is different from your vascular plants where um, in bryophytes, the gametophyte is the dominant stage. And in vascular plants, the um, sporophyte, um, which is the two end stage is the dominant one. So. Uh, for bryophytes, the gametophytes, the dominant, and then they produce sporophytes, which are your two in, and those produce the spore and stuff like that. Um, intimately tied to their environment. So uh, they dry out if there's no moisture, they're active when there's moisture. And here's an example of um, 
of a uh, uh, sample that was dry for a while. It's been about, about a year. And you can just add one drop of water and it rehydrates uh, the gametophyte, so the moss here. And as soon as they receive that water, their cells and everything kick back in, they start getting active. It takes, you know, it can take a few days or it can take a day or so to get back fully active. But as long as that moisture is present, they'll get going. You can see it actually um, opening back up, uncurling and uh, greening back up, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and they, they do certain things to their, their, their um, overall appearance when they're dry and stuff like that. Um, so that's, uh, so your mosses is your bryo, uh, bryophyta. Um, and they, again, there's kind of two stages of mosses there, or two kind of uh, growth forms. There's, uh, which are referred to, um, that you can get familiar with, with IDing um, will help you, is your acrocarpus mosses, which are these kind of like what you think of those tufts on the ground. When you think of those carpet, they're kind of like a tuff on the ground. Um, they kind of form this tuff, you know, they have uh, their, their stems are kind of just upright, and they terminate with their sporophyte, which is this thing off the top. So it's kind of right off the top. Um, and then pleurocarpus mosses uh, are ones that tend to branch out and they look really feathery and they look really nice. You often see that like in uh, really wet forests and stuff like that. You'll have these really, really multi-branching um, stems and stuff like that. And you can see the two difference between those and the two groupings for the mosses helps with identification if you can kind of get that in place. Um, leaf, so again, there's a whole set of, of terms for leaves for bryophytes. Um, it's a little bit different, terminology is a little bit different, but it kind of, you can kind of pick it up pretty quickly because they're kind of talking about the same thing. You have bottom part of the leaf, you have the uh, costa, which is the middle, you can have what the cells are doing in the inside and then your margin and your apex and stuff like that. Um, and oftentimes identification with mosses are uh, done from leaves and sporophytes, which you got to put under a, a microscope. So you'll do a dissection and put under a microscope. Um, we'll go ahead and skip over reproductive parts for mosses. Uh, they do do asexual reproduction. They'll have other things like uh, tubers and stuff like that and leaf bulbules that allow them to asexually um, persist. Um, liverworts. Um, are pretty, pretty common. Um, there's not that many usually species in an area. They're, they're, you know, they're not that uh, abundant. Um, but there's two, two types. There's leafy liverworts, which are here, which have more kind of what you think of as leaves when you look at the stem. They have these little projections that look like leaves. And then there's these thalloid liverworts, which are kind of what you think of like when you think of a liverwort, it's like a strap like kind of shape, like it's kind of, it's called thallus on the, on, on the floor. Um, and they also produce uh, sporophytes. They produce these structures that are called archegonophores and antheridiophores, um, which produce the sperm and the egg and then go on to produce the sporophyte, which are these guys there too. Um, hornworts, won't talk much about hornworts. I don't have much experience with hornworts actually, um, but they they also have um, the same thing. They produce sporophytes. Um, they have a really cool association with uh, cyanobacteria in the, in the actual thallus here, but they're very characteristic if you're in the field um, and you see this thing that looks like a liverwort, and then you may be looking at it and you notice this long, long kind of like almost looks like a spike coming off of it. And then it's kind of like breaking down. Um, and that's the, the horn or the long sporophyte that comes off of it as well. Um, okay, so plant families. Uh, I'm going to just touch on a few here. Uh, your Asteraceae, so like I was talking about, they have their that head inflorescence. Um, and they, they have a unique inflorescence in the sense that the head is broken up into um, those discs uh, florets and those flowers and these ray uh, flowers. Um, so here's your ray flower and here's your disc flower. And they're all kind of congested on this, this head that holds those all up. Um, and that's very characteristic of Asteraceae. Now they can lack the ray flowers or they can lack the disc flowers and those turned into different types for Asteraceae, but they're one of the largest families. Get to know them because they're everywhere. And they're amazing. I love Asteraceae. Um, they have an inferior ovary. Uh, they have five petals that are fused. Um, they, the um, calyx is actually modified into that. Uh, it's called a papis or papi. It's the it's that stuff that you think of when you blow on a dandelion, that puffy stuff that carries the the fruit there. Um, that's the papis, and it's actually a modified calyx. Um, and then again, like I was mentioning, head inflorescence. Different types of head inflorescence you can be seen in Asteraceae, so radiate head, discoid head, and ligulate head. Um, 
again, it's just lacking. So these heads just lack either, uh, you know, they either have both the disc or the ray floret, which are those, you know, parts here and there, or they just have ray florets, which is the ligulate, or they just have disc flowers, which are here, and they lack the ray florets. Um, some examples, bush sunflower, California sagebrush, uh, golden bush, and then onto the mint family, they have opposite leaves, square stems. Um, so if you look at the stem, the stem is actually square. And then again, with the, the placement of the leaves, they're opposite. Um, they have bilateral flowers. So that's where that bilateral symmetry comes in handy. Um, their inflorescence usually have like a whorl. So it's kind of like a little like pom-pom um, that you'll be familiar with. And then they often have aromatic properties, usually produced by those glands, uh, glandular trichomes on the leaves and stuff. Um, they have an ovaries that's superior, um, five petals that are fused, and five sepals that are fused. And, um, pretty characteristic uh, plant family. You, most people either have a member in their, their garden if they grow mints and stuff like that. A um, couple examples are sal, uh, purple sage, black sage that are local around here that are natives. Um, Anacardiaceae um, are usually trees, shrubs, um, and they're, they, um, again, will produce a fruit that's a droop. Um, and the flowers are often very small. Um, and they have five petals, five sepals. Um, and members of the Anacardiaceae sumac family are like your mangoes, cashews, and poison oak are in there as well. And some examples, lemonade berry, floral sumac um, as well out here. And then uh, polygonaceae, so buckwheat family, uh, very diverse, uh, very common on the landscape, uh, especially in California. Um, and they, you know, they form herbs, shrubs, vines, and trees. They flowers are small and typically clustered together. Um, and they have an akeen fruit. So if you ever, if you ever um, kind of get into the little flower when it's brown and you can pop out the akeen and there it is, that's the actual fruit right there. And then the seeds inside that. Um, and then the ovary is superior and there's five to six uh, tepals. This is where that kind of gets a little bit tricky with the, the um, petals and the sepals they have tepals. Um, some examples, California buckwheat, um, ashy leaf buckwheat. Um, again, if you're hiking out around the hills here. Um, oop, I had a double up on that one, sorry about. Uh, and then bryophyte plant families, I'll do really quick. Um, so typically Podiaceae. So Podiaceae is a, is a really common one. Get familiar with that if you wanna go down bryophyte lane. Um, is They're very common in uh, arid and semi-arid environments. So around here, um, out in the deserts and stuff like that, they're often associated with biological soil crust. They do really good in the dry environments. And yes, moss do occur in dry environments, very dry environments. Um, they're acrocarpus mosses. Um, they're the largest family of mosses in number of genera. So they're very diverse. Uh, they usually are turf forming. So they form that turf again, which you characterize like that kind of um, turf on the floor there. Um, and then they, typically are green distally. So like, again, the furthest part of the gabinophyte is kind of green up here and then the below is kind of brown. Um, and some genera to be familiar with is uh, Didymodon, Centrichia, and Tortula. Um, those are really common around here. So those are good to get familiar with. Um, and if, if you ever want any of this information, just email David and let me know and I can send the information. I know I'm moving very fast. Um, Bryaceae. So actually my son's name is Brian. And he's named after one of the uh, genus here, Brian. Um, and he's typically one of my favorite. Typically, they're found in, in semi arid to arid environments. Often, uh, they're a very large family, and they're another acrocarpus moss. Um, they're often found in disturbed soil, um, intact soil as well. But oftentimes, like around uh, houses and around the urban environments, you'll find a lot of Bryaceae, uh, and you can kind of pick them up pretty quickly that way too. Um, and they have a really diverse array of. Um, reproductive structure. So they have the tubers and the, the leaf bulbules and all these ways of asexually reproducing. Um, they have these really cool looking capsules that are kind of pendulate um, and very large. Uh, a couple genera to be familiar with are Bryum, uh, Jimabryum, and Rosulabryum. And those are very common, especially if you go hiking around here um, on the peninsula, you'll come across those as well too. Brachythesiaceae, <laughs> uh, they are your pleurocarpus moss. So I threw a pleurocarpus moss in there. They are around here. There's actually quite diversity. Um, they're kind of glossy mosses. If you look at them when they're dry under the microscope, but this picture doesn't do it too much of Jesse. They kind of have a uh, glossy look to them. They have plicate leaves. So they, if you look at the leaf, it's kind of undulated a little bit when you have it under the microscope. Um, they, they have a single costa, and that's again, that single 
part up the middle of the leaf, which is kind of like the midrib for your vascular plants. Uh, they have short capsules, so they're, they're sporophytes, the little capsule part's pretty short. Again, they're pleurocarpus moss, and general to be kind of familiar with are sclerapodium, brachythesium, and homalithesium, um, and those are kind of your common ones. So if you're hiking around here and you look in a lot of the um, shaded areas, like on tree trunks um, or on soil, and they find this nice big kind of branching moss, um, those are going to be um, your brachythesiaceae. Um, and then, oh gosh, this family is always hard to pronounce. Aetonaceae, I think I'm getting it wrong, <laughs> but they're a liverwort family. Um, but you're very familiar, if you go hiking anywhere in Southern California, it's a very common liverwort, Asterelia. Um, and it's a, it's a complex phthalic, uh, uh, phthalic liverwort, so it makes that kind of a characteristic liverwort shape, that phthalic kind of strap, uh, strap shaped look. Um, often grows in colonies, so they kind of kind of grow in these big uh, colonies and they'll kind of be in nice shaded areas. Um, and they usually form again that flat rosette of light green. And they produce these very characteristic um, antheridiophores and archegoniophores, which are these, these weird looking like structures that come off. You're like, what the heck are those? And those actually produce the sporophytes. The female one will produce the, the sporophyte um, that goes on and the very characteristic. So, um, and then a, uh, Richiaceae, if I'm pronouncing that right, I can't remember how to pronounce that one, um, is another kind of thallus uh, liverwort. Um, again, another common one uh, found around here. Uh, they're very fleshy. It's kind of interesting. They're very fleshy um, and they make this very characters rosette kind of circular shape on the ground. Um, very small, but they often, you can find them on, um, I found them out like on the El Segundo Dunes, um, sand, soil, um, very common during the really beginning of uh, uh, rainy season. And then uh, general to be familiar with that is just Rixia. Um, I'd get familiar with that and you'll, you'll, be, you'll be on a good, good path for identification. Um, resources really quick, uh, plant identification terminology, two thumbs up for it. It's been my go-to for the longest time for plant identification. It gives it, you get a lot of terms in identification, plant identification. You're like, what the heck does all that mean? And some of these keys don't actually give you pictures to all those uh, terms. And uh, so this is actually, it's a, a pictorial glossary. So you actually can see pictures of what the heck they're talking about. Um, the Jepson manual always go to, um, the Flora of North America is another great dichotomous key to go to. Flora of Santa Ana River, if you can get it. I don't know if they print it anymore. It's really helpful for just that flipping through to get familiar with uh, plant families. And then if you wanna dive into bryophytes, which I highly recommend, uh, give the love to the bryophytes do it and you'll you'll never turn back you'll get blown away every time you look in the microscope um california mosses and mosses illustrated glossary and thank you so sorry getting really close <laughs> sorry um but uh yeah if there's any uh david if i don't know if there's time for questions or anything like that but um yeah well, thanks thanks neil that was really amazing uh trip through a lot of details of plants and uh, i learned a lot and I know we had some of our uh, Palos Verdes Prince of Land Conservancy uh, walk leaders that were on, uh, on the, the, the uh, program. And even though you did go fast, um, it, it is being recorded. So um, people are welcome to go uh, to our YouTube channel or go to our website uh, and you can watch it again or go right. you know, parts that you need. Um, so it, it's gonna be a really uh, useful resource for people. Uh, before we get into questions, I want to thank um, most everybody stayed in for the whole talk. Um, I want to remind people, I put it in the chat, uh, we need volunteers for our plant sale on September 30th, Friday, and uh, Saturday, August, uh, October 1st. Um, and then we're having an outreach event at Friendship Park on August 13th, um, <clears throat> if anybody wants to uh, come for that. So... Um, Let's see. Um, oh, um, uh, Dr. Naidu uh, says this was an amazing presentation. Thank you. Um, I will just uh, comment one more time what I said before the program um, that uh, I, I just am blown away by the pictures of the mosses being rehydrated. Your, your video, yeah. just, it's incredible. So having said that, um, all right, so um, Megan said, uh, thank you. Uh, Alex Covery says, uh, thank you. Your pictures are incredible. Love your presentation. I would uh, second that. Uh, Cindy, uh, uh, thank you. And Brent put in the chat the um, uh, link uh, 
uh, Dean uh, said this was a real treat. Anyway, rather than try to read all these comments, uh, does anybody have, uh, feel free to unmute yourself um, and um, um, and, uh, and you could ask your questions. Yeah, Rosalie um, wants to know on the plants that create a fruit with that hard um, section inside, how do birds end up eating those? And sorry, I've forgotten the correct terminology. Well, it, it depends. Yeah, it's the um, um, droops. Are you talking about the droops, Rosalie? The yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it it depends. It depends on how the the plant presents it. So, uh, you know, like uh, cherries. Cherries are a droop. Um, they have that stony middle part. If you've ever you know eaten a cherry, um, and inside that is the seed, that stony part. So the uh, for like that, like locally, the birds around here actually they they'll just eat the flesh on the outside. They actually scrape. If you hike around um, a lot where the Catalina cherries are around here on the peninsula, you'll notice now this time of the year when they're ripe, you're like, what the heck happened to most of that cherry? And if uh, you'll sit and watch, you'll see birds, small birds will actually get up there and they can actually scrape their beak and take off the outer part of the uh, the fleshy part of the droop off. Um, or, you know, a rodents or any other uh, mammal will actually gnaw, you know, eat that part. And they just discard this, the, uh, the stony part or they'll cache it. Um, or um, in other parts, droops can actually be digested and they'll, that outer part will be um, digested off. And then that stony part will actually pass through the digestive system and then be, you know, passed on and then germinate and stuff like that. So it's it's kind of just depending on how the, the uh, plant presents that droop. And they can be, uh, they can be uh, very, you know, very modified, um, especially like, uh, you know, in Anacardiaceae and stuff like that. So, um... I believe uh, um, Al Sattler has a question next. You know, echoing what was in the chat for the video, um, that wasn't real time, I suppose, or was it? Or, or it was. Or, wow. Yeah, I forgot to I forgot to mention that. So that's real time. Yeah, and that's what I mean with uh, they're so intricately like connected with moisture in the air. So like. It, it's amazing, yeah. Like I have, I have samples from grad uh, grad school that you know, I haven't looked at for years, and you know they're dry and dry. Like we're talking dry, dry. Um, and you put a little drop of water on them, and they rehydrate um, immediately. And uh, some, you know, I've read some papers. It takes you know anywhere from a couple of days, and depending on how long they've been dry, it can be a slow restart up. Um, but yeah, like that example, that video was that sample was about a year old. And it got rehydrated and it instantly, you know, started unfurling and getting going and then it'll start to kick back on photosynthesizing and everything. It, uh, it just takes a while for it to kind of put back. There's a whole lot going on in the, the, the leaf cells and it takes a while. But yeah, they're, they're functioning get go back because, I mean, if you're a moss and you're tied to your moisture availability, you know, you may only have a few months, uh, you know, where there's water available, like especially down here, the, a lot of the mosses, um, you know, never get to the making sporophytes because it's been so dry. You know, they'll just get a little bit of moisture. They got to keep going, and then it dries out, and that's it. That you're done with your 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 year in that if you don't get any other moisture and stuff like that. But yeah, so they have to kind of be quick to respond to any available moisture. And um, a lot of our one uh, mosses around here um, actually the marine layer. So at night when we get that nice coastal fog will actually um, be enough moisture to bring them out of dormancy. And actually you can go out, they'll be dry during the day and you go out, it's a good marine layer um, with a flashlight and you'll see they're all open and 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 hydrated and they'll hold on to that water a little bit in the morning um, and grow a little bit and then dry out again. And it's, yeah, it's a, it's a slow, it's a slow grow time for mosses and, and uh, liverworts and stuff like that in drier places, but like in other parts where there's more moisture, they can stay kind of active a little bit longer. But yeah, that was real time for that video. As I said, so are you saying that they will go, you know, basically go dormant again during the next day for the ones who are living from the? Yeah, they completely, they complete, they'll they'll completely dry out. To I mean, we're we're talking almost completely desiccated. Like they they lose all. Not all, I shouldn't say all, but they lose up to, you know, anywhere from like, I think they can go down to like 5% to 2% of their moisture. Like they can, they can pretty much are dry and not, and they just completely uh, um, dormant. Like, and it's, it's even not even dormancy, it's like desiccation. And then, then they can just get that moisture again and come back alive and, and, uh, and start yet, you know, getting active again. But yeah. 
Okay, we have two um, somewhat related question. Um, uh, Karen wants to know, she has one coyote brush uh, plant and if it's dioecious, how come it's making babies? So, okay, so if she has, and that's, I didn't, I didn't mention that in the PowerPoint. So some, some plants like even lemonade berry, they're typically, um, you know, typically dioecious. Um, but then they can also produce plants that can actually um, have bisexual flowers on them. It's not, it's not too common, but they can, um, where they actually have functional stamens and pistils. But so they're technically dioecious, but then they also can uh, produce um, bisexual flowers. Some individual plants will actually be bisexual. Um, and then they can do another crazy thing where they can actually do like a bisexual flower. They have some bisexual flowers in the inflorescence and but they're mostly then all the rest of the flowers are always stamens. So you might actually have a coyote brush um, and they do that too, where you, you might get some fruits uh, developing, um, but they it, it shouldn't be a lot. So if it's if it's like what you think of like with uh, backers or the females when they get that nice snowy appearance to them where it's all that fluff, that's fully functional pistolate. But uh, I have seen male plants that actually have some bisexual uh, flowers and they'll develop into um, what kind of look like, uh, you know, functional fruits. Um, and they can sometimes germinate and, and have a functional fruit, but um, look closely at it because the males can actually kind of uh, have these like brownish, when the, the flowers dry up, they can actually um, have uh, kind of a brownish look and then the, the um, pappus would kind of be there. But the female flowers are really elaborate. Um, the flowers will produce like the um, pappus will kind of elongate out and then they'll be so dense when they, the heads open up that it's kind of fluffy. So you might have, you might have gotten one that's a, might have some bisexual flowers in there with it. Is it possible, uh, or is it possible that there she has a female uh, plant and there's a male plant somewhere nearby? And then the corollary to that is how close does the male plant have to be? I mean, could bees land on a male plant and then travel? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not too sure. I mean, it just depends on the pollinator, I guess. I mean, it. It. I mean, bees. You know, I'm not too sure what really pollinates. Uh, coyote brush, but yeah, if you have one nearby, I mean, there's a possibility that yeah, it's just getting pollinated from a boy nearby. Like I have, I've got, I've just got a boy in the yard, and and the, there's no females near around. Like, is it is it you know actually doing any pollination anywhere? I, I have no idea um, if it's actually getting. But yeah, for the female, there might just be a male nearby, and it's actually producing uh, producing fruit. But yeah, I don't know if they if distance wise how long they can go for. But that's yeah, good possibility. It, it, it's a male nearby. Maybe uh, she should go out at night and make sure that her uh, coyote brush is not hitting the town. Right, I know. Yeah, you might be watching your. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, some somebody I forgot who it was that uh, asked. Uh, she has two uh, lemonade berries, but no fruit. So. So she pro she probably has. Karen has Karen has one coyote brush and fruit, and I think it was Adela said she has two uh, lemonade berries and no fruit. So it, it can be, it can be a couple things. So you might have like, um, actually we, a while back, I remember Tony was talking about it, Madrona Marsh. And there was, I think there was a female that, so again, if it's, it's, uh, if you like, say you have a male and you have no females, you're not going to get any fruit. Um, but if you have a female and there's no males uh, nearby, you're not going to get any fruit. The fruit won't actually develop. They won't, it won't get pollinated. They won't actually develop fruit. And I think that was the case at, at Madrona Marsh. And I'll have to ask Tony again. I think he had, there's some females there. They're all females, but there's no males. So they're not actually developing fruit or it's the other way around. They only have males. And they need females to actually uh, produce there. But yeah, you might only have um, your female there um, and no males and stuff like that. So you won't get any produce, uh, producing fruit. But if you can find a male and get a male, uh, you'll get some fruits and stuff. Well, it's a good thing we didn't have any kids tonight at this program. Right, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, lemonade berry, I, I, you know, David, lemonade berry is a whole amazing, uh, there's a story going on with lemonade berry too, and it's quite fascinating and, and stuff like that. But yeah, lemonade berries are, you know, around here on the peninsula are, are really common and there's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff going on with them. Oh, Tony says there's only 250 insects associated with coyote brush, so. Oh, well, there you go. So that's pretty amazing. So all right. something's got to be, yeah, something's got to be bringing it in, bringing it in and pollinating it. 
that's that's only insects not counting right the, <laughs> of mites and spiders yeah i know i mean it's just got to be everything wow that's amazing all right well any other questions well thanks a lot Neil. yeah i, I do have a room. quick question okay, one more sorry <laughs> i don't know if you can hear me um yeah, i can't is there any way to tell if it's a male or female because if I have two two male lemonade berries, uh, bringing in another male won't help. If I have two females, right. bringing in a male will help. So it's like a lot of uh, hit and miss. Is there any way to tell what I have? Yeah, I mean, if you can get uh, if you can get like a, a normally when they're in gallons, they're not flowering yet, um, and it's I think oh god, Tony would know best too on like how big and gallon size they need to get to, to flower um, and and how old they need to be. But yeah, you essentially got to sex your your lemonade berry and figure out, um, you would have to do, essentially you'd have to just do a little quick cross section of the flower to take a look. Um, or you could kind of poke around in there with a magnifying glass or a loop and see if it's got those parts. Female female flowers, they're also, I didn't mention in the, the PowerPoint, they, they look, um, their appearance kind of look a little bit different from the males. Um, but, uh, you know, if it's, if it's got a nice, uh, carpal or pistol, like really developed in the center of the flower, that's a female and that's a nice way of determining it too, as well. Um, but if it looks like it's just all like stamens and you're like, ah, it's a lot of stamen going on there. It's probably a male, okay. but yeah, you'd have to, you'd have to wait until you get, you get, uh, flowers and then you have to dissect your flower, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Could it be a hybrid with a sugar bush? Yeah. Oh, so that's where it gets crazy too. So, so uh, lemon hay berry and sugar bush. Yeah. They, they can, they can hybridize and, uh, uh, they can actually, uh, you won't get, you, so sugar bush is the same way too. They, they, they are dioecious as well too. Um, what you'll get is you'll just get this hybrid between the two. Um, and there's two types of hybrids and I've, I've talked Tony's head off on this one, but it, it gets complicated and it's, um, there's hybrid zones and there's these, uh, and that's what I was talking about on the peninsula. It gets a little interesting here, um, but yeah, it shouldn't af affect uh, too much on your fruit development. Um, it's going to make fruit, de depending if it's more the sugar uh, sugar bush hybrid, expressing more of the sugar bush or the lemonade berry. Um, that won't uh, worry too much. But if you have the straight uh, straight uh, sugar bush with straight lemonade berry, you might not get fruit set. So if you have like a sugar bush. Uh, male versus uh, lemonade uh, female, um, you might not get that fruit set. Um, hybridization is kind of like a, it's a rarer thing that happens out there. Um, so you might not get any fruit development, but yeah, um, there is a possibility of that as well. Yeah, I got the I got the plants from the um, <clears throat> the Land Conservancy PV land. Oh, okay, yeah, those should those should, yeah, so those should be uh, a lemonade berry. Um, and yeah, again, you'll have to just wait till it flowers to tell. Um, I'm trying to think of, I can't remember how old or how big they need to be before I actually see them flowering in, in pots. Um, but yeah, you'd have to plant and just see and then, and, and hope it's, hope it's a female. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you so much. Cause I've been wondering now, I promised my little neighbor boy when he was four years old that he'd get oh. some lemonade berries when I planted yeah. it. <laughs> And he's like looking at me like I'm nuts because he's 11. Yeah, he's like, now. what is that going to happen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 They are really cool. The fruits are really tasty. And yeah, they're really, they're really neat to, to see. And kids love them. My son, he, 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 uh, he, he loves them and he'll, you know, on the trail, be poking them in his mouth and, <laughs> and spitting them out. And, and he enjoys it quite a bit. Yeah, well, I think they you. take years to flower. Yeah. I think Tony's right on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think you'll have to probably uh, go and, and uh, pick some out in the wild somewhere at a, at a, at a, uh, a garden or something, preferably, yeah. um, or take them out in, on the trail so you can see them. There you go. You could take your female, if it, if you have it in a pot and it flowers, you could just take it out there and put it next to a male. <laughs> You could well, do a little dating. That, you know, I, 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 I was thinking do, about taking that the dedicated neighbor. to your plans. I didn't mean that. I, I was you know. thinking about taking the neighbor boy. Um, not, <laughs> not, right. Uh, now I'll dig up one of them and put the other opposite sex in if I can figure <laughs> all this out. <laughs> all right. But they've been there for seven years. They got deep roots. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. So they're established. Yeah. Well, that's one thing for sure. Uh, they routinely have roots that go down 40 feet. And uh, I think it was Bob Douglas said they were doing core samples and they found lemonade berry roots as deep as 90 feet. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, they are incredible plants. They really are. They, it just, every time more and more I learn about them, I'm just blown away how amazing lemonade berry. And yeah. there's not much, there's not much out there in terms of information or really on known about them. I mean, um, it's kind of surprising when you look at the literature, there's not much on them, like in terms of, uh, of just, um, relationships and distribution and stuff like that. And, um, but yeah, they're really amazing plants. Yeah. I've been like searching the internet for a long time and I can't find anything that says anything close to what you've told us today. Yeah. And as we, and it, uh, and it, for me, it was the, you know, learning a lot about the lemonade berry was literally through plant identification. Cause I was looking at them. I'm like, you know, noticing some characteristics. I'm like, that just doesn't look right from what the key's saying. Um, and you look at all the keys for lemonade berry and you're like, wow, this, you know, for our population on the peninsula, I'm like, that just doesn't look right. It's not matching any of the keys. So what's going on here? Um, and then you start digging more and more and you go down the rabbit hole and you find out more and more. And it's, uh, so again, it's just a spring point from a plant identification. It's, you start noticing some differences in the field after looking at the key and you're like, wow, that's, that's a little bit different. So. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Neil. I know it's getting late for you too. So we yeah. really appreciate your uh, uh, joining us on, Neil, Neil uh, came on very short notice. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. No amazing, problem amazing presentation and um, we're really happy to see you. And again, your invitation is on for a, a focus on brow fights next year sometime. Yeah, I would love if, you know, depending, you know, hopefully everything stays, you know, good with COVID and we don't have any surges and all those kind of things. I would love if, if, if we get rain, that's the other requirement. Uh, I'd love to do, I was talking with Chris about it, is starting to set up some uh, some plant walks, some plant ID walks and uh, bryophyte walks and stuff like that. And if we get some rain um, in the winter coming up, um, you know, we could we could hopefully do a walk and stuff like that, get the chapter out and even just looking at some of the local bryophytes and stuff like that. We could do like a talk and then a walk or something that weekend or something. That'd be really cool. All right. We'll, we'll yeah. talk more about that offline. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Okay. All right. Bye, Dan. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, you guys. Bye, Al. Bye, Barbara.